Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Rebecca Ross. I'm the program director of graphic communication design program here at Central St. Martin's University of the Arts London. So I am coming to you from the Central St. Martin's building in Granary Square N1C in the GCD studios on the second floor in the F block and we're in London. Um, and today is December 15th. So we're no longer in national lockdown as we were during our last event in this series. Um, universities in the UK remain open, but most of our classes during these last weeks of term have been moved online to keep things flexible for students over the holidays. So this is the second event in our program's first ever online lecture series, which also happens to be our first public lecture series. I'd like to once again extend a warm welcome to all of the GCD students in London and around the world and our guests, whether listening live or tuning in on YouTube later. So on our depth of field website, which is csmgcd.net slash lectures, you'll find an intro to the series and some more links and information related to tonight's event. I'd like to remind everybody that we call this a lecture series, but it isn't actually made up of long lectures. It's, um, it's rather a series of six events held throughout the year. And the basic format for most of these events is as follows. We invite two speakers on the basis of some kind of interesting and relevant connection between their work. And together, um, I work with them to co-create a specific focus and title for the event. And as you'll see during tonight's event, each participant then takes 15 minutes to put forward some provocations, questions, and or examples for our discussion. And from there, we'll all come back together and I'll moderate a discussion which will draw in questions from our audience on YouTube. As a reminder, if you want to participate in a discussion, you will need to log in to YouTube. So um, you can do that um, now if you want to take part. Um, so for tonight's lecture, that's not a lecture, titled The Politics of Publishing, we are joined by two very special guests, Danielle Aubert and Rathna Ramanathan. So I'm going to introduce each of them before they speak. But um, before we jump in, I would like to mention that tonight's event also coincides with the establishment of a new publications workshop here at Central St. Martins. So the college already has a long history of printmaking, bookbinding, and letterpress. The new workshop brings together some of our previous traditional bookbinding equipment with some newer, more industrial printing and bookbinding processes, enabling students from throughout the college to experiment with printing, binding, and paper in new ways and to develop publications in additions. If you're a current student, you can find out more about the details of this workshop on our technical Moodle. For many graphic designers, what comes to mind when thinking about publishing are books, magazines, and newspapers. This is not at all incorrect, but there is something important about the possibility of creating editions or work in multiples that I would like to emphasize as we get into tonight's discussion on the politics of publishing. The Oxford English Dictionary defines a publication firstly as an action of making something publicly known. An important aspect of thinking about publications is to consider how they support different kinds of knowledge to travel and circulate within and around various communities and audiences. Publishing is the basis for how knowledge is mobilized. So I invited Danielle and Rathna to join us for a discussion about publishing in this expanded sense in order to set an ambitious tone for how we think about publications as we start to use and explore the possibilities of the new workshop and continue to, to develop our curricula in relation. So we're gonna start um, first with Danielle, who is joining us from Detroit, where it is currently the middle of the day. Um, Danielle is a graphic designer whose work examines materials, methods of production, machines, and labor. She is an associate professor of graphic design at Wayne State University. Um, you can learn more about her work on her website, which is daniellobear.info. And I, I highly recommend taking a look. In, in addition to her work on the Detroit Printing Co-op, which she's going to talk about tonight, there are some incredible projects going all the way back to um, a well-known project of hers entitled 16 Months of Drawing Exercises in Microsoft Excel. And one of the reasons I draw your attention to this is that she actually initiated this project when she was a student back in 2005. So it's quite interesting to trace that trajectory to now. Um, so with, with, uh, with that, I think I'm just going to turn it over to Danielle. Thanks. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, and that was a really great intro. Um, hopefully this talk will live up to what I'm, to, 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 to some of the ideas you talked about. Um, so 
I'm going to talk about um, the Detroit Printing Co-op, which is something I've been researching for several years now, um, and um, hopefully kind of open up some some kind of like ideas with, that might be relevant to um, the politics of publishing, like we've been talking about. Um, okay. Okay, so in 1969, Freddie Perlman wrote a pamphlet called The Reproduction of Daily Life. Freddie and his wife, Lorraine Perlman, would go on to print thousands of copies of The Reproduction of Daily Life, first through a collective called The Community Print Shop and later at the Detroit Printing Co-op. They distributed these pamphlets primarily through the mail, through their publishing house, Black and Red. The Reproduction of Daily Life is Freddie Perlman's reading of Marx's theory of commodity fetishism. He describes the process by which those of us who live in a capitalist society reproduce the conditions that tether us to a life of selling our living activity for wages. He says, we use these wages to buy commodities and access to spectacles, which we then experience as passive observers. We're consumed by things and unable or unwilling to act to change those things. This produces in us what Freddie calls a death in life. The problem of overcoming passivity is one that Perlman would return to again and again in other texts. As he was writing The Reproduction of Daily Life, Perlman was engaged in publishing early issues of Black and Red, a magazine that he and Lorraine had produced with comrades in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Through this work, he recognized the labor of actual printing, like the physical labor of printing, but he also wanted to reframe that labor as non-alienating. He wrote in The Reproduction of Daily Life, quote, Digging, printing, and carving are different activities, but all three are considered labor in a capitalist society. Labor is simply earning money. Living activity, which takes the form of labor, is a means to earn money. Life becomes a means of survival. I would argue that in a way, Freddie Perlman's life project was to figure out how to break out of this cycle, how to exit the reproduction of daily life. Perlman aimed to make printing something other than a means of survival, something that, other than a way to make money. Um, in order to do that, he saw printing as a craft. Each pamphlet that was printed at the Detroit Printing Co-op had political weight. It was made by people who had the will to bring it into existence, but who were not compelled by wages. Freddie and Lorraine created the conditions for this kind of work by setting up the Detroit Printing Co-op, which existed from 1970 to 1980. In the years leading up to starting the co-op, Freddie had been in Paris during the May 1968 student worker uprisings. And after, afterward, he produced this pamphlet with Roger Grégoire, um, kind of describing the, the, the events from, from their point of view. He had also had a two-year position at Western Michigan University, which was long enough for him to become deeply cynical of academia. And he produced this pamphlet on the right. In late 1969, Freddie, Lorraine, and their friends found space in Detroit and borrowed money in order to buy an old offset press, darkroom materials, and other machines and supplies necessary for setting up a proper print shop. They immediately began printing, publishing, and distributing leftist books, pamphlets, and posters. The co-op drew a wide range of people from across the city, most involved in movement politics. Some of the publications printed over the course of the 1970s included the first English translation of Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle, the Black Star publication, The pa Political Thought of James Foreman, six years worth of issues of Radical America, which was the journal for SDS, the Students for a Democratic Society, Rebel's Voice, which was uh, produced by a group of Detroit high schoolers, Sorry, at the co-op, the acts of writing about and debating politics were folded into the activities of page layout, typesetting, printing, binding, and trimming. Insofar as it could be possible to conceive of a left approach to graphic design, that work that came out of the Detroit print Printing Co-op could be said to embody that ethos. Everything they printed um, included a union bug, which is what you see here, like blown up. Um, it was like a little label that was printed on all their materials. Most of the users of the co-op had joined the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, a radical union dedicated to direct action, workplace democracy, and industrial unionism. They refused to engage in wage labor. They refused to hire people to clean, do bookkeeping, or any other menial tasks around the print shop. Freddie and Lorraine did all the stages of production, often writing or translating texts themselves, editing, laying out pages, physically printing the pages, binding, trimming, packaging, shipping, and distributing them. They came up with a set of guidelines for the co-op along with the other initial founders. 
they said that the equipment of the printing co-op, I'll just read the first part of this. The, the equipment of the printing co-op is social property. It is and shall be controlled by all individuals who need, use, and maintain it. It is not and shall not be owned or controlled by any individual or group of individuals, whether they claim to serve, represent, or speak for society, whether they are elected or self-appointed. Freddie Perlman wrote The Reproduction of Daily Life before opening the co-op, but for him, committing to the project of running the Detroit Printing Co-op represented a break out of that reproduction of daily life. The act of leaving a comfortable job in academia to, creative produce, to creatively produce tangible objects was itself an attempt to take active control of his own life and shift out of the mode of selling his labor for wages. However, he recognized the limits of this act, like the political limits of this act. He wrote in this document, quote, an individual can surmount death in life through marginal creative activity, but the population cannot, except by abolishing the capitalist form of practical activity, by abolishing wage labor and thus de-alienating creative activity. So Freddie Perlman was acknowledging here that in order for actual large scale system change to take place, it would require more than a person here and there engaging in anti-capitalist creative production. There are two editions of the reproduction of daily life. And the most obvious visual difference between the two is that the photograph on the cover changes. So in the first edition, which is here, the it looks like it's the interior of some kind of a textile mill. And then in second, the second edition, um, which is was printed, uh, there's a lot more like um, printed samples of this. This is clearly uh, the inside of a car factory. But in the first edition, there are at least three different type treatments for the text on the cover. The production quality is rough. The image on the cover doesn't fully bleed off the edge of the page and the pamphlets were never face trimmed. One effect was that we as readers, or we, one effect is that we as reader, readers are aware of the labor and the craft that goes into the production of these pamphlets. Notably, we're aware that the craft is not that great. But that said, Freddie Perlman was fascinated with craft. Lorraine Perlman later said that in the early years of the co-op, as they were learning to use the equipment, quote, Freddie was exhilarated by all aspects of the new activity. He frequently asserted that never before had he felt so intellectually stimulated as he was by the challenges and gratifications he found in mastering the graphic arts equipment and technique. And again, and just to clarify, he had no like training in printing or design as he was doing this work. Around the same time as Freddie wrote The Reproduction of Daily Life, he also wrote a text called The Incoherence of the Intellectual, a comprehensive review of the writings of a socio sociologist, C. Wright Mills. Mills wrote influential leftist books and articles in the late 1940s and 50s at a time when political activity on the left in the United States was at a low point following the McCarthy years. Perlman had met Mills when he was a graduate student at Columbia in 1956. Lorraine said that C. Wright Mills appealed to, to Freddie because unlike other liberal professors, Mills seemed like he was more radical. He expressed open outrage and frustration with the conditions of everyday life. Um, and a decade later, by like, you know, the late 1960s, Freddie Perlman himself had become a professor at Western Michigan University. He wrote The Incoherence of the Intellectual shortly after leaving Western, um, at that point, pretty frustrated with academia. And he makes three key points in the text. First, that intellectual distance from laborers leads academics to passivity and inaction. Second, people create and uphold institutions through their own daily activity. And third, that there is a liberatory potential in what Mills and Perlman both refer to as craftsmanship, which they characterize as a unity of design, production, and enjoyment. The incoherence of the intellectual is both a political treatise and a beautifully crafted object. It's impossible not to take note of Perlman's inventive use of color and type throughout. At this moment, when he was writing, laying out and printing the book, he, Perlman himself was in search of some kind of political and intellectual coherence. His own life decisions could be seen in contrast to those of Mills, an intellectual who had stayed in the academy writing books and articles that for Perlman were in direct contradiction to his lived ex existence. For, for Freddie and Lorraine Perlman, moving to Detroit at the end of 1969 to set up the co-op was a way to escape the death in life that threatened to stifle their existence. 
1967 Detroit Rebellion and the 1968 general strike in Paris were fresh events. It felt like Detroit had revolutionary potential. And, and although Freddie Perlman was critical of Mills, ultimately, he was still really interested in the way that Mills wrote about craftsmanship as a potentially non-alienating practice. And I think as it related to printing and publishing for himself. So Mills describes a craftsman-like style of life. And he contrasts this with one in which people's lives are split between work and leisure. Mills would write that a person's true interest is too often relegated to a hobby rather than being central in their life. So for a person living a craftsman-like style of life, the unity of design, production, and enjoyment would be the very root of free human development. So for Mills, he's saying like craftsman, you know, what he's calling this craftsman-like style of life is key to, be, to like feeling coherent and, and being free. For Mills and Perlman, the freedom of the craftsperson lies in their ability to work according to their own plan, to set up the conditions within which they will work to determine what it is they're gonna do and to do it. As Mills wrote, wrote, quote, the continual joining of plan and performance brings even more firmly together the consummation of work and its instrumental activities, infusing the latter with the joy of the former. Since he works freely, the craftsman is able to learn from his work to develop as well as use his capacities. In the case of the professional designer, Mills would argue that that unity is ruptured. The activities of design, <clears throat> production, and enjoyment are split. And as Perlman puts it, the individual loses coherence. This rupture produces a space for mass cult culture to fill with frenzy and trash and fraud. Not only is that rupture damaging to the designer as a person, but it is damaging to culture more broadly. <clears throat> so Perlman, at that moment that he was writing The Incoherence of the Intellectual, was, was especially engaged with figuring out how to combine images and text, how to mix colors, how to experiment with typography. And this was one of the most complex projects that he undertook. Through this exuberant printing project, he was kind of trying to demonstrate that you could be an intellectual and be an engaged worker and be an agent for change. Over the years, um, like Perlman printed a lot of other projects at the co-op, the printing became a lot more sedate. It was like one color um, for the most part and just straight text. But there are certainly other examples of experimental printing. Just notably, I'll just show a couple images of this book, The Manual for Revolutionary Leaders, which includes these elaborate collages. Um, there's like a whole session, like section with these colorful drop caps at the start of each paragraph with, with um, like world leaders. This is a uh, Mao Nehru. Um, <laughs> By the mid 1970s, so this was actually published in 1972, so still like early on in the co-op, but by the mid 1970s, the co-op had repaid its debts and the users no longer need to take in work for hire the way that they had at the start of the decade. One of the most consistent clients had been Radical America. They printed six issues a year from 1970 to 1975. But in a, <clears throat> in a 1977 issue of Radical America, um, Barbara and John Ehrenreich had coined the term professional managerial class or PMC, which they defined as, quote, salaried mental workers who do not own the means of production and whose major function in the social division of labor may be described broadly as the reproduction of capitalist culture and capitalist class relations. The PMC includes scientists, engineers, teachers, social workers, writers, accountants, accountants lower and middle level managers and administrators, and I'd add to this list graphic designers and publishers, but not printers. The PMC, as they write about it, is in an antagonistic relationship with the ruling classes because they do not have control over their own lives. They work for the ruling classes. At the same time, they're in an antagonistic relationship with the working class because their jobs are to manage and manipulate, manipulate working class life. For instance, at work as managers and at school as teachers and administrators. The Aaron Ricks wrote, Historically, the PMC exists as a mass grouping only by virtue of the expropriation of the skills and culture once indigenous to the working class. And I just thought this was an interesting point to consider today and with relation to this topic we're talking about, when we think about the way that the stages of labor associated with printing and publishing have shifted over time. So work or craft that was once associated with different stages of the printing process, like setting type, 
has you could say has now been expropriated by the PMC through the role of the graphic designer who sets type. <clears throat> so in many ways, the trajectory of the Perlman's and the co-op followed these larger historical and political movements. Their move from university activism in, in Paris and at Western Michigan University to Detroit, which, was, which is a factory town and in a majority black city, follows a path described by the Ehrenrichs in their essay. Free Broman was the highly educated son of working class parents, and he could be what, an example of what the Ehrenrichs would call the radical PMC of the 1960s. He and Lorraine sought to radicalize publishing by making it accessible to the community, rejecting copyright, and rejecting the need for expert or professional editors, translators, printers, or typesetters. In the late 1970s, the US suffered economic crises and the professional managerial class itself was already shrinking. The Ehrenrichs note that it was difficult for the radical PMC to sustain itself. Meanwhile, the printing industry overall was in decline and commercial print shops were closing. The primary users of the co-op by then were Freddie and Lorraine who were printing books for their publishing house, Black and Red. At the end of 1979, their landlord informed them of plans to sell the building. So, <clears throat> From the outset, the focus of the co-op was to be a productive space where people could print whatever they wanted, uncensored, without anyone's labor being exploited. And for 10 years, they did that. Um, and so, you know, just in closing, I think the legacy of the co-op has had an outside effect, outsized effect. It was a small space. They produ produced kind of thousands of pamphlets and had an impact um, kind of beyond uh, what you would expect from their scale. So thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much, Danielle. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, I'm going to shift quite quickly to introduce Rathna. But before I do, I just wanted to remind everybody that if questions come up as you're listening, do feed them into the chat in YouTube, and then we can kind of come back to them in the third part of the event. So um, next, we'll hear from Dr. Rathna Ramanathan, who is joining us from across London. Um, Ratna is a graphic designer and researcher known for her expertise in intercultural communication and typography and non-mainstream and experimental publishing practices. So some people know this, some people don't. Ratna was on the academic staff of the graphic communication design program here at CSM from 2009 to 2014. And she's currently the Dean of the School of Communication at the Royal College of Art. We're excited though that she's going to be re rejoining Central St. Martins as our new Dean of Academic Strategy from January. So in addition to introducing Rathna, I'd like to also take this opportunity to form formally welcome her, welcome her back to CSM on behalf of GCD. So I'll turn it over to you now, Rathna, thank you. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, Danielle. That's like a great start, I think, a fab introduction. Let's hope this, this lives up to it. So I'm just gonna, um, start sharing my screen and then hopefully we will be good to go. Great. So um, over the COVID months, I've really been reflecting a lot about my purpose and contribution of what I do as a designer, a teacher and a researcher. And I've come to summarize this for myself as a practice that recognizes and believes in two things. First, that all communication matter material processes, such as publishing here, are inherently political. And two, that communication is a fundamental human right. So I'd like to unpack some of this with you today, very briefly in the context of publishing. But before I go any further, I think it's useful for me to share the meaning of the two words, politics and publishing, and the way I understand them and use them in my own practice. So for me, when I speak about politics in relation to creative practice, this refers to a set of activities that are associated with making decisions in a group, to the power relations between individuals and organizations that make those decisions about the distribution of knowledge, resources, or status. Who gets what? Who gets excluded or included? How is communication formed? And when I speak of publishing, I speak of this in the expanded sense, not just in terms of print publishing, but digital, sonic, textual, visual, experiential, material even, 
So the act of making information, knowledge, music, software even available to share with others. Now, someone in a Viva um, recently said to me, and I'm just gonna see that I can move my screen. There we go. Someone in a Viva I was recently and said to me that we need to think of design as a third language. And I think this is absolutely right. Language defines our context and our environments. It shapes how we think, communicate with each other and form and describe our view of the world and ourselves. So we need to have an understanding of the power that's embedded in form as well as through the acts of creative making. Now on this slide, we see two coins of the co uh, uh, two sides of the coin of communication. On the left is an image of the melting Arctic, turning from ice and snow into fields of green. Beautiful, yet very alarming. And when I see this image, I can't help but reflect on our role, my role as a designer and communicator. I wonder how complicit we are in this. We design and support the world in multiple acts of consumption for people to buy and consume things. But what if we thought of design or communication as an act of giving, enabling and supporting instead? How would this change our approach and what impact would this have on the world? To use an example to illustrate that on the right is Mahatma Gandhi on the SALT March, which was a visual act of civil disobedience and one of the events that led to India's independence. A moment that I consider to be an act of publishing. Communication as a material act here, using one ingredient, salt, to organize and bring people together in a political nonviolent act of positive rebellion. Now in the School of Communication at the Royal College of Art, we ask ourselves in our research and in our practice, what does it mean to be human? Now you might ask, why is this question important? Because as humans, we often see ourselves in our perspective at the center of the world, but we are not at the center of the world. We forget that we inhabit this planet with other non-humans, plants, animals, minerals, for example, that, it, that share this earth with us. We also forget as humans that there are multiple different audiences and experiences. For example, on the left, adults and children. This is a cover design I created for a text that's a satiric account of a childhood in times of war as seen from the eyes of a child. And it's uh, in Sri Lanka during this time, but a lot of the stuff that's in there is translatable to other places which are going through similar things. My point is that we forget that not all of us see things in the same way. And I think it's really critical that we keep this idea of difference in our approach so we don't lose the many ways of thinking, making and being in the world. And we need to consider intercultural approaches to education, culture, publishing and typography. So why is this difference important? Here is an example I show in my talks with students at the RCA. On the left is the image of the earth taken on December the 7th, 1972 by the crew of Apollo 17 spacecraft on its way to the moon. The image on the left is the original, how the photo was taken. But before it was circulated, it was flipped because it was felt that people wouldn't recognize this as the earth. So the image on the right, which is now one of the most reproduced images in history, is the one that we see and recognize. And this, the original and the flipped, re reveals a divide in humanity. If you look at that red line on the right image, at this moment that this amazing picture was taken from outer space, there was cyclone in Tamil Nadu where I'm from in India. So on one side, you have innovation, a picture of all of humanity. And on the other side, you have trepidation, people without the basic means to protect themselves from natural disaster or, or calamity. And this image brings home to me the importance of framing and the role that we as visual communicators or designers play in how we present the world. As David Attenborough recently noted in relation to critical issues on climate change, many of the issues we face today are a result of communication or a failure of communication. How we frame things, how we speak about them, how we articulate things visually. Who gets our communication? Who doesn't? What platforms do we use? What type of language are we using in the communication? And how do we then start to tell reality from fiction anymore? And what happens when we turn the tables and view the world from the perspective of the other? Here's an example of this. 
The origins of printing and publishing in India are entangled with colonial ambitions. Boventura de Souza Santos notes that these ambitions sought to discredit, erase, or appropriate the knowledges of the global South with the aim of contributing a really dominant global North knowledge and culture. So consider this example on the left. I want you to imagine for a minute that your language is Tamil, which is my mother tongue, and that's the language we see on screen. Now imagine that the first time that you see your language in print, it is used to communicate a text that is almost alien to your culture. And imagine the power that is contained in this act of publishing to use someone's language to represent back to them a culture that is not their own. On the right is another example of how Indian knowledge has been colonized. This is a text called the Hortus Malabaricus, Garden of Malabar by Hendrik van Reed. And it's a comprehensive treaty about the properties of flora in the Western Ghats in India, covering the states of Kerala, Karnataka, and Goa. It's written in Latin and was compiled over 30 years and contains about 720 species in pen and ink drawings, each of them accompanied by a detailed description. Now, for me, what's deeply troubling about this text is that whilst it was collated and compiled, by natives as they are referred to in the text, Indian experts in the field, it was only available in Latin till the 21st century. So this text has been largely inaccessible because it was not available in any Indian language. So here we find knowledge about India, written with Indian knowledge, inaccessible to Indians. So who decides what is knowledge and who this knowledge is for? And what is knowledge if language and the visual form prohibit people from accessing it? In my own work, I have sometimes worked with sociopolitical themes or agendas. And my approach to typography and publishing are less about a crystal goblet and more about where I grew up. So my first attempts at reading were the big visuals that I saw on the street in India, whether they were posters or, or, or cinemas or billboards. And my childhood in India has also influenced my approach to typography, seeing it both as text and image. It's a visual, colorful language in its own right with its own voice. So in this example, it is design and typography that helps us situate universal narratives within a local context. It takes a question about human experience and relates it to specific contexts visually. So this is a 1928 German poem about politics, oppression, and war that is recontextualized in a modern Indian setting and brought back to life in a different way. Now, my work with Tara Books has also been about giving a voice to marginalized people who don't normally get a voice. I worked on this book, The London Jungle Book, with a brilliant Gond artist called Badu Sham. The book is titled both as a homage and a kind of mirror image counterpoint to Kipling's Jungle Book. And it tells the story of Baju's journey, his first journey outside of India to London. The book has a layer of historical significance. A century earlier, Baju's tribe had been studied by the British anthropologist, Veria Elwin, who married a Gond woman and wrote several books about the tribe. Now Baju's grandfather had been Elwin's servant. So he'd grown up with these stories. And Elwin had written in the preface of one of his books that he thought that this was a, counter, a counterpoint to um, counterpart to Kipling's Jungle Book. So the London Jungle Book was summarized by Baju who said, Elwin Saab has written about my tribe. Now it's my turn to write about his. The book led Baju and I to another project. The area where Baju is from is called the Hindi heartland in central India. And for BBC World Service, the bulk of their audience for the Hindi service was lived in this rural area in very small towns. So the BBC launched a campaign to get in touch with them called The Voice of the People, which was a roadshow that traveled to about 44 different rural locations and spoke to about 140,000 people. We created the visual campaign to support these roadshows and they were most almost entirely visual because literacy levels were low in this part of rural India. However, the visual language of the folk art is able to convey complex and subtle images and messages 
through narrative, metaphor, and symbolism. And we used traditional methods of making public that were more appropriate to the context. Wall paintings, tin plates on shops and stalls and rickshaws, street banners. And there were several contexts and potential contradictions to consider. There's the complex history of India and Britain. There's the fact that this is an international brand communicating with rural Indian people. And that the communication had to converse with the people in a way that was specific to them and appropriate to them, while also being true to the brand. The results were incredible. BBC increased its Hindi audience by 7 million in three years because they were paying attention to people who hadn't heard their voice heard. And the program makers had a better understanding of the rural listeners that they were, and they started making more suitable programs for the people that they had met. Now, for the past six years, I've been working on a very special project. The Multi Classical Library of India is a facing page translation series where the aim is to represent the greatest literary works of India from the past two millennia to the largest readership in the world. The volumes are essentially an invitation to diverse pre modern literary worlds in languages such as Bangla, Hindi, Kannada, Marathi, Pali, Punjabi, Persian, Sanskrit, Sindhi, Tamil, Telugu, and Urdu. So the original Indic text in the appropriate script is accompanied by an English translation. And it caters to different readers. Those familiar with the Indic will appreciate the annotated text and those who cannot read the original have the modern English translation. Now the Murthy Library was funded and founded at Harvard University by Rohan Murthy. He's a computer scientist who was schooled in India and then went to study at Harvard. Now Rohan, like myself, grew up in India where our education was at best a colonial education. We had access to the greats like Shakespeare, but there was little access to our own heritage. And Indians are not taught about the Indian heritage nor read about Indian classics or stories in school. And this was the real impetus for setting up the Murthy Library. So whilst we acknowledge the importance of typography as a craft, I think it's equally interesting to consider how we use typography as a way to understand and engage with the world. When we design with rather than about people, we can amplify unheard voices, we can challenge notions of caste or class or race or gender or other hierarchies, and we can support fundamental concepts of human and environmental rights. Additionally, it reiterates the importance of knowledge born and anchored in the experiences of marginalized people, not just for those people, but for the world. So to wrap up, in my practice, I'd like to understand the politics that surrounds typography and language, the power that aesthetics, that the visual and the word can carry as a voice and a language in itself, to ask how can we use design, publishing, typography to include people rather than exclude them? And how can we give those without a voice a chance to have one? I think communication is powerful and persuasive and inherently political in all its aspects, but it can also be divisive and unifying in different ways. So we must acknowledge that politics is embedded in publishing. And this means reconsidering quite archaic definitions of audience and consumer that we use in visual communication because this leads to undemocratic, hierarchical, and divisive approaches that negate both research and communication as fundamental aspects of human rights. I think that everyone deserves to have an access to their heritage. Everyone deserves to be communicated with. Everyone deserves to receive or be part of a communication that's appropriate to them. And everyone deserves to be considered in a communication that is about them rather than for them. So we as designers, communicators, and publishers have a really key contribution to make here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. There was, there's so much interesting material there to discuss and the presentations were in dialogue with each other in such an interesting way. So first I'd just like to remind everybody to please um, put questions into the YouTube chat if you want to bring them forward. Um, I am going to start with a question that came through specifically for Danielle that I 
think we can kind of branch out from. So um, the question was, can we relate the ethos described by Perlman with the resurgence of the risograph today? I think so. <laughs> I've, I, I've um, and I think that, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there were, there were like differences. Um, there, there are big differences um, in terms of um, just the political, like, importance of printing a pamphlet in like 1970 compared to printing a pamphlet today. Like I think what Rathna was speaking about is actually good because it's really like communication now is so much more, um, there's all these other methods of communicating. And so I think a Rizzo print now doesn't probably carry the same kind of a weight as a printed object in 1970. And, and the other thing is when they set up the co-op, they were actively being followed by the FBI and the Detroit police and they couldn't physically print a lot of the things they wanted to print because of censorship. So by the end of the 1970s, nobody really cared anymore. And I think it's the case a little bit with risograph printing now. However, like thinking about, I actually just, the thing at the end that I had about the professional managerial class, it's something that like, I actually don't know if it's a useful term to think through these things, there's a lot of like debate about whether that term is even really helpful or useful. However, I just reread that that article yesterday, and I was thinking it kind of does apply to like graphic designers using Rizzo printers um, in a way, um, kind of taking a craft like Rizzo printing. I think before it was sort of popularized through graphic design was something that was done in like churches, and it was kind of a low tech way of reproducing stuff. Yeah, I was actually thinking that because you you kind of there there was this um, ideal of the relationship between freedom and craft that yeah. I think working now with Risograph kind of gives a sense of that kind of there's like a freedom in it in in some way, but I actually was starting to think about the relationship between that idea of freedom and craft being connected with um, what. Rasna talked about in terms of design or publication as giving. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I would come back to that question about risograph and say, it's a, maybe it depends on what, what, the, what the giving is. I don't know if it makes sense as a relationship to you, Rasna. I think it's interesting what you're saying, Rebecca. I think that um, owning the means of one's production, I think, is 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 something. But perhaps we're so used to that now. I mean, you know, I can I can... I can jump on a tweet right now or, you know, take Snapchat and get on Instagram and get on social media and sort of, you know, own the means of kind of making public. So I think somewhere along the way, I almost feel like we've kind of taken that as a given, the distribution as a given. And we need to sort of retrace a little bit and sort of think about why, what are we doing and why are we doing it? Is it, you know, what is our purpose? And, and, and kind of put, you know, imbue the act of publishing with that purpose. Um, which is which is what you know Daniel was talking about that there was you know they felt that certain things deserve to exist and that's why they kind of you know printed them and I think that there's something there to be said about that intention and understanding that intention. Um, that's interesting. It relates to sort of two other questions that are coming through. Well, one of them was uh, sort of I had jotted down that I, th I thought that um, the idea of Freddie Perlman's idea of the equipment as social property probably has a, a very different relevance to how we work now than what would appear on the surface in relation to what both of you were just saying. Um, and actually, in relation to that, uh, a question that just came through, which is intriguing, is um, there is a trend for self-help slash kind of political adjacent publications in recent years fueled by smaller publishers. Um, and the question is, is this a reprisal of, of Perlman's idea or is this, is this just a neoliberal version? Well, you know, I, I see this is where that PMs, not to keep going back to that text, but this like 1977 Ehrenreich article felt kind of relevant. And I don't wanna get too excited about it because I know a lot of people are critical of it. And the PMC was a term that was used like derisively to describe in the US primary elections, kind of like wealthy white liberals, you know, it was like, it was like kind of like this, like, you know, that are kind of, but, but I did think that there were some things in there that were useful. And specifically with what you're talking about, Rebecca, 
um, the, the Aaron Ricks kind of describe this thing where like you had this whole new generation that came in like in the US in the 60s, you had this expanding layer of people, the PMC that were like professional managerial class, which was like people who, like there was a more and more of a need for people to work in these kinds of jobs. And so it might've been people whose parents were working class, you know, but then they were going to colleges. There was all these new colleges, you know, there's like more um, and more kind of public education available. And so then they would go to college and then kind of, but then kind of had these like radical left politics. And a lot of the people on the left were members of this class. And so the, um, what what was kind of interesting to me was they write about how they would go then when they finished high university they would go into these professions and then try to radicalize them and I was like I feel like I see this in design right now where and and this is kind of the work of the co-op and in, in, in some ways maybe it also re relates to what Ratna is talking about about democratizing kind of the access to communication where it was like people were going into their fields and they give these examples of like radical teachers who would open up the classroom to the students say like students figure out what what should we be talking about and like radical um publishing where it's kind of like we don't actually have any special skills everybody should do that um you know and like and i and i feel like i've definitely seen this trend in design and you know and especially i think i think when um Ratha was saying like design with not for like, I think this is coming out of that same thing. And I think that there are, um, it feels like it, this is important. You know, it's like the, uh, you know, you're trying to kind of push back against these um, generations of like this, you know, like in this case, like kind of colonial printing where it's like, okay, we're gonna print this stuff. Um, we're gonna take this knowledge and kind of like make it accessible, not to people locally, or we're gonna, um, you know, we're just going to print Christian stuff for people who are reading Tamil or whatever, you know, so it's like this kind of like pushing back against that. Um, what was just interesting to me was just to see that how it feels actually so similar, what I was reading about, you know, happening in the like 60s and 70s to now, even though the conditions have changed, it's like we're still kind of stuck in this thing of like, what, how do we respond? That was just rambling, but I don't know, Ratna, if you have any thoughts on this? <laughs> I think that what's interesting here is I think to go back to what you said very early on, I think that there's something about that community. And I think that for me, publishing in many of these cases was having a conversation, reaching out to connect to somebody, share thoughts in, in, a, in that kind of conversational way, rather than just sort of delivering, just sort of like, well, here it is, you know, have at it, but actually using the kind of process of publishing as a way of kind of enlarging a community or having a conversation sort of you know building a shared community and I think the co-op brings a different model in, in that sense that's that's really interesting that's that's not you know immediately hierarchical in the way of well that's your role and this is my role uh but but also in itself as a kind of conversation in the act of making that depends on the people and how they connect with each other so I think that I I got that sense as well when you're talking it's like this is really familiar to even now when I work with our books, you know, that is a co-op model. It's a very different, and the books, and as a result, what comes out is quite different than, you know, in a, in a sort of slightly a removed process, industrialized process of publishing. I have a question in relation to what you just said. Um, you, you sort of talked about using the process of publishing to have a conversation. And I guess I'm thinking about this in relation to the really interesting point you make about human rights and communication as a human right. Um, is, is there any, a distinction that you could draw out, Rathna, between publishing and kind of having a conversation um, like you might with a friend or something like that? I think it's a couple of, I think we're, we're also, I think perhaps it's an approach in a sense, and it's also, um, there are many people who don't have a voice. And I think that that's, it's incredible that they're just kind of, you know, they're removed from having a voice. So I, I could see that this idea of the book as an object carries some part in that if we're talking about print. But I think that even giving a talk, I think something like this is not really about delivering um, your idea of knowledge, but actually about having a dialogue about it putting it out there, making it public in the world so that someone is responding to you about that. And so that's the way we kind of build a community of people. That's the way we engage. That's the way we kind of come together. It's our action. And I think that if we thought about it differently, that's what I meant about the act of giving 
and actually facilitating rather than act of consuming, uh, I, the author, here's my fantastic thing. I think that then it completely changes that process of that conversation. And a conversation can be had, you know, intergenerationally. So when I looked at my PhD, I looked at people in the 40s because I was interested in, you know, how they approach something and, and thought about skills. And I could see Daniel seeing that, and, you know, but you see also pre colonial stuff and you see, well, India's schooling is still in the same place. So you still have issues that we're kind of facing where people's voices or the texts or, you know, are not heard or published. And I think thinking of publishing as something that deserves to exist as a conversation that needs to be had um, I think is a much more kind of cooperative way of kind of going about knowledge, which is what publishing really is about making something public, rather than a kind of like a monocultural approach about this is the canon, for example, if you're bringing it back to design. And I don't know, Daniel, if that kind of resonates with some of the things you've been thinking through in relation to why this was interesting to you to research in, in the first place. Yeah, no, totally. And I think, I think, I mean, I think one of the things is the co-op model just just at the outset, that's an interesting model. And I think especially today, but one of the things I've also been thinking about just lately, cause I've been doing kind of research on the co-op for a few years, like for a long time now, it feels like, but, um, but the, but the, this thing about the reproduction of daily life, you know, of just like, cause you, cause you also kind of brought this up at the beginning where you said, you know, like as a designer, you kind of sometimes you feel complicit with certain of these kind of like you know, horrors that are going on in the world where you're like, you know, there's this like massive climate change happening or whatever. And what ways are we contributing to the world of consumption and how, how are we kind of um, propping that up? And I'm kind of like, one of the things I've been coming back to is, is that um, idea that kind of Freddie Perlman was talking about is like, how do you break out of that cycle? Like when, and what acts are actually, you know, like what, and he, he was always trying to get people to kind of be less passive because one of the things he talked about after going to Paris in 68 was how many people, you know, there was like a massive general strike, but he sort of reflects on all the people that were just there like as onlookers and to watch. And so he would kind of get frustrated because he would say like, here we are handing you the means of communications. Okay, we're in Detroit, we've got this printer, anyone can use it. Why aren't like the oppressed factory workers or whatever coming in and using it all, all the time, you know? Like, why aren't the people who like don't have a voice coming in and using these machines that we're making accessible? And I think that this was kind of like this kind of ongoing thing where, you know, he's, you know, which I think is a, you know, which I think like can, can sometimes be this like wall you hit up against where it's like, okay, you know, we're going to make these like pamphlets about how everybody can have, how, how more people can kind of have access to communication means, but then it, there's there's this kind of continuing like passivity or something that he would talk about where you know you're also just kind of keeping the status quo going um I mean I think it's a bigger conversation but that's something I've also been kind of thinking about lately yeah, there's definitely a connection between sort of uh facilitating publishing and just facilitating scale and community. There's something about the relationship between publishing and scale and community. And that sort of, in, I think, interacts with, I think, what Danielle is saying about publishing as acts that sort of break out of structures. Well, um, and I mean, yeah, and just as an example, I think of the co-op, I think of the co-op being in downtown Detroit and you know, or they were Southwest Detroit, they're doing their work compared with that example that Ratna gave of the BBC going and reaching 7 million people. You know, it's like a totally different scale of penetration, you know. It, there's um, kind of a lot of debate about the relationships between kind of neo-Marxism and post-colonialism as being kind of questions about whether neo-Marxism is compatible with post-colonialism. Um, and actually, it feels like there's something here about the relationships between sort of the anti-colonial and the anti-structural that is, is really interesting and, and could be developed. Well, the other um, thing is, oh, yeah, sorry. Well, just that Freddie no, Perlman, ahead, Freddie Perlman later in life was like, he like, what, he didn't identify as a Marxist or anything. He likes Marx's ideas, especially at the beginning. But it's interesting because at the end of his life, he just got really into like plants and into like researching um, indigenous, the like, the 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 people that were like in the land before was Michigan, you know, like the Anishinaabe and Ojibwe people, and like did this whole like long elaborate book um, 
research about this area. So I think, it, and he became, he's actually kind of more known if he's known as a kind of anarcho-primitivist who like argued for taking your machines and throwing them into the forest. And like, so it's also kind of, it all kind of comes full circle. Like he was, he didn't trust any, he was completely anti-state and didn't trust like communism, socialism, anything like that. So I have, um, I have a kind of maybe two more questions. Um, one of them is, um, and Rafa, you touched on this, but I'd, I'd love to come back to it. Could, could each of you say anything about how your work has been transformed or is being transformed in relation to some of these ideas by your own experiences of, of 2020? Rathen, do you want to go first? I saw your mouse yeah, start to move. Sure. <laughs> I saw something down your book. Yeah. Um, I think it's a couple of things. I think that also, uh, I think 2020 has been really interesting, not just for COVID, but I think it, it yeah. sort of says, you know, uh, not just for that, but I think that there's been loads of things that's, that's, that have happened. So, for example, you know, a month ago, there was like, you know, three cyclones in, in India, for example. And I think, COVID has sort of been like an x-ray that sort of revealed a lot of the inequalities that kind of exist. And I think for me, I just feel that I can't, coming from where I come from, I can't actually ignore that anymore in my, in my practice because, you know, I teach, I teach in a very elite institution, but our universities are mainly there to kind of, you know, have a connection to society and community. So it's that, that also kind of needs to be taken seriously. So I think that for my teaching research practice, I think it's really about the, that, how can what I'm doing actually have an impact and be useful uh, to people outside of my circle in, in that sense. So I think that that's the relevance of what we do. I think that that's important. But I think also we can't escape from the fact about how we're actually impacting things. I think the, big, the really big issue is no matter what we're talking about, at the end of the day, there is one planet that we're inhabiting. And if we kind of destroy that, there's nowhere else to go right now. So I think that, you know, we do need to consider our complete, you know, how complicit we are in, in, in what we're putting out there, what we're supporting, what brands we're looking at, their politics. I think it's becoming much, much more complicated. I think that, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement has also raised a real sense of who gets something and doesn't get something another sense of inequality that's really like profound and sort of fundamentally embedded in society. So I feel that we can't avoid any more thinking about design is connected to, to it. So I think that, you know, it's not purely an artistic practice. It's a communication practice. So I think that we're really kind of incumbent upon ourselves to sort of have to take that role really seriously in, in kind of how we kind of go out there. And I'd say, also to consider, I think it's really important to consider who we are. I think that's equally important where you come from, who you are, provides a kind of critical anchor in how you approach something. So let's not also not avoid looking at that. Let's actually embrace that. Let's think about how where each of us is from brings about that different conversation. So that, you know, like that today, you brought us together to have a conversation, but we're coming from two very different contexts. And I think that's exactly what, what it's about. So I think that yeah, absolutely. I think that considering that, because then we can kind of create a little bit of a reaction that 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 opens out a little bit, and more people will kind of join us um, in this in this very very big talk. Thank you, Danielle. Do you want to do you want to add anything? Or um, yeah, I think for me, um, one of the things that uh, I started researching the co-op um, and Freddie Perlman. Um, you know, a while ago, and then, but then, um, actually, there we, we had an, I, we had an exhibition of this work, and then um, in 2016, and um, right during that time, Trump was elected, and so that really threw things kind of into perspective. Where I was like, why am I going spending all this time in the archive when we have like full on fascism happening here? You know, so I kind of ended up. Um, over between 2016 or 2017 up until now, you know, got really involved with the left um, movements in Detroit and spent a lot of time just like trying to identify all the different groups because 
um, I saw how active, you know, the co-op, the co-op produced so much material during that time. And you can see how it's not perfect. I mean, they had a lot of, um, um, you know, people were doing projects that would kind of like peter out or whatever, but I thought you have to do something, you know? And so I kind of ended up getting really active with um, like the local, you know, socialist group, the DSA in Detroit. And then when Black Lives, you know, when George Floyd was killed, um, there was huge protests here in Detroit. And um, then, you know, I kind of got in more involved with that. And the thing that happened here, which, I mean, the thing that was kind of like has been that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about, which I think also connects, you know, to what Rathna has been talking about is that like, is the way kind of graphic design functions in um, movements, you know, and like looking at, for instance, you know, these mass massive mobilizations were happening after like an Instagram post, you know, and you'd be like, okay, the need for graphic design is, on the one hand, you can be like, you don't really need it. You know, you don't even need graphic designers. You just make a post and then people show up. But on the other hand, from for participating like more actively, for instance, in my union and in this like socialist group, you know, and kind of on the fringes of this, like the Black Lives Matter group, I felt like you do need graphic design skills. Like whenever you bring those skills to the table and you produce something, you're, you know, I, we are, we, I, I, could, I could see how you're able to like, we do provide an important skill, you know? So it's like, we shouldn't pretend like we don't, I don't know. I kind of go back and forth between like graphic design doesn't matter, making posters doesn't matter. And then being like, actually just making a Facebook event banner that looks good draws in a lot more people actually, you know, so it does kind of matter. So, um, so I think like at this point, I'm actually looking, I've been doing like a series of kind of like interviews with graphic designers who identify as leftist or are active on the left and have been trying to kind of talk to people about some of these things like the professional managerial class or like what, where, or where, you know, you know, what, yeah, how can, how, how, what does it mean to kind of like confront like post, or like how, how, how can you be like post-colonial or whatever, like how are people working now and what kind of actions can we do and what role does design pay, play? Because I think it's still there. It's still, it's obviously, you know, it's communication design. We're obviously doing something, but like um, trying to figure out like what the nature of that work is. Um, but I'm like, I'm like really don't know what it is. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. No, 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 it's really interesting. So, okay, I was, I, we're, we're running out of time now, but maybe I just ask one kind of like very quick fire question that if you are, if something comes to the top of your head to kind of wrap things up, um, you know, see what, see what you think of. The question is, um, if you were going to give a piece of advice to students right now who are just sort of nearing, you know, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, uh, students who are at the early stages of be being engaged with the profession of graphic design, what advice might you give? Or maybe who are interested in publishing or publications? Sorry if that's too big of a question. I asked it like really slowly. <laughs> <laughs> I unmuted, but I don't have an answer yet. I don't know, Rathna, if you have. Okay, I, I would uh... say, Rebecca, you threw me with the last bit, which is when you said publishing. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, because <laughs> okay, I would, just, I would, just ignore I'd, that bit. <laughs> <laughs> I think with that, I'd say uh, working. I think getting experience like, and hands-on experience, you know, working with a community and kind of engaging with other people who are very different from yourself is probably like, you know, the, the best thing that I would say in terms of kind of growth. But I would say, um, otherwise I, I would say it's, I would look inwards rather than outwards in that sense. I think it's really important to find a purpose rather than attach yourself to a brand or an organization or an institution because it will last beyond that institution or organization. And I think that's really, really important because that's something that you can have a tether with that will change wherever you go and it'll grow and it'll kind of gain momentum uh, to something and, and trust, trust that you do have that within you and that it's it's speaking in a different way than what you're used to, but you'll hear the voice kind of pick up um, as 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 you kind of keep in touch with your practice. Yeah, that relates a lot to the sort of having the basis to be engaged in conversations through your work as you go through your life as a designer. Danielle, do you wanna do you wanna add anything to? I mean, I think that was good. I think I would just say like kind of thinking about some of you know just to keep up your craft or keep up the thing that you like doing you know so 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 a lot of times 
jobs are kind of soul crushing or whatever, but like, I think it's important to kind of keep up what you like to do because sometimes that can ideally become the thing that you're doing most of your time. Um, Absolutely. And I think that in a pandemic, in a pandemic where we haven't had any sense of the future, where it's sort of, it's so, you know, it's so unstable. I know that the future is always kind of unknown, but even more so now, I think that um, making something says that we do have hope for something after this. We have a hope of connecting with each other after this. So I would say make, I'd mm-hmm. say practice and make. I think that's the that's, best thing that I, you could do for all of us. That's a great place to finish. Okay, I'd like to say um, just a few things to wrap up. Um, so I, uh, the next lecture in this series is scheduled for January 19th. And our plan is to develop this around the question of how the climate crisis is a crisis of communication, which is something that I think touches, you know, Ratna actually touched on quite directly um, in her in her talk earlier. Um, we're still refining the details and we're gonna have more to announce either side of the holidays, but please keep an eye on the webpage for the series, which is again, csmgcd.net slash lectures. And there'll also be updates on our program's social media accounts, which are at CSM graphics, both on Twitter and Instagram. And I'd like to just say thank you. Thank you so much to Danielle and Rathna for joining us this evening and being really generous participants and guests. Um, we really appreciate it. It was a really interesting conversation and it was terrific to hear you present your work. Um, I would also like to say a quick thank you to Jacob Watmore and David Frame for their work on the series behind the scenes. So thanks everybody and take care. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, Rebecca.